record. This is Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. And our agenda today is three bills. The first one uh, we will be considering voting on. Uh, that's Senator Senjem's Senate File 2854. And for the record, uh, we'll let the record show we have quorum. And this is the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. Senator Senjem. Welcome uh, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I have Senate file uh, 2854 dealing with the monitoring of, uh, of, uh, of controlled substances, if you will, or at least uh, altering substances uh, at, at roadside uh, stops. And uh, But I have an A1 amendment that I need to have put on uh, the bill. Thank you, Senator Senjim. Uh, this is the author's amendment, the A1 amendment. Author wishes to put it in the form. Uh, Senator Matthews moves A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Senjim. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, uh, this bill was before this body uh, last year. And uh, I think to put into the bill, it didn't quite make it through the whole process, but uh, uh, it's an important, uh, I think, uh, idea that needs to be uh, carried forward with it. It has to do with the, uh, with the law enforcement on, on public highways in Minnesota confronting situations where they have suspect of uh, perhaps some level of drug abuse or use, whatever the case might be, and uh, that might impair driving. And uh, as uh, I guess most of us know by now that, uh, I mean, certainly there's breathalyzers and ability to test uh, alcohol levels, but there's no real uh, technique or tool available to test uh, for, the, for the presence, if you will, of, uh, of any other kind of chemical substance in, in, in the body. So, so this is an oral test uh, process that's been devised. And, what this uh, particular bill proposes to do is uh, set forth a pilot program where this uh, particular tool can be tested uh, for accuracy and uh, and all of the things related to uh, to uh, the, the kind of situation the officer is confronting and uh, perhaps if uh, all goes well in, in the test uh, uh, experience then in a subsequent uh, bill later on this can be applied uh, more generally but it's a one year it's a one year pilot study it uh, has to do with uh, developing initially a, a plan with the Commissioner of Public Safety involving uh, you know, certainly other appropriate groups and putting a test plan together. Uh, oral fluids uh, would be obtained uh, for this project, uh, certainly uh, by law enforcement officers on, on, on the highway uh, system. Uh, the, uh, any, any driver, this is a voluntary test, a driver would need to consent to uh, taking this test, but uh, so it is voluntary. The results can't be used for for arrest or prosecution anyway. Uh, and then there's a report to be returned to the uh, uh, this committee. And I believe this would probably be the committee, uh, maybe other other appropriate committees as, as the case might be uh, for uh, subsequent assessment and uh, decisions rather, you know, in terms of going forward on this kind of a, of a, of a uh, implementation process. So with this, with this particular tool. So that's the essence of the bill. It's simply, uh, can we go forward with an accurate and uh, yeah, and legally defensible uh, uh, tool that uh, might help police officers uh, on on the public uh, thoroughways of Minnesota uh, make some judgments about the impaired nature of a particular driver. And so I have uh, Mr. Leslie, right? Mr. Hanson. Hanson, I'm sorry. I answered you. Sorry. Uh, I have a witness, uh, a testifier here for me, and, uh, and he, he will describe uh, the bill from his perspective. Welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Mike Hanson, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Office of Traffic Safety at the Department of Public Safety. And the bill, as Senator uh, Senjum described, uh, was before this committee last year, was passed last year, and uh, after input from members of the committee. And uh, as Senator Senjum outlined, it's designed to allow us to test the efficacy and the accuracy and the operational aspects of uh, oral fluid 
uh, sample testing that can be conducted by law enforcement at roadside to help them evaluate a driver who may be impaired by something other than alcohol. In essence, for those of you who may be familiar with what uh, law enforcement calls a PBT or a preliminary breath test, that is the device that is currently certified and used by law enforcement across the state as a final uh, uh, way to uh, determine somebody's level of impairment based on alcohol. The PBT simply confirms that the impairment that the officer has observed is from alcohol. And we're asking to test instruments that now are capable of doing the same thing for up to seven categories of controlled substances or impairing substances. The technology itself has been studied and well-developed, and many other states are implementing similar projects uh, across the country. Uh, Wisconsin has recently started to use some of these instruments. Indiana has a very robust program uh, that they are rolling out. Michigan is also very involved uh, in a robust pilot that they've extended uh, in their state, and they're now looking to make that pilot uh, permanent. So what we're gonna do is put the test instruments in the hands of our drug recognition evaluators to start with. And uh, as Senator Sengem said, this would be a voluntary participation uh, by drivers who have already been arrested for a controlled substance drug offense. And then the results from the roadside instrument uh, would be compared with the actual evidentiary test that the BCA would already conduct based on uh, the arrest that had taken place. And through that process, we can uh, come up with a set of best practices for law enforcement to use in the field. And we can also establish the efficacy and the accuracy of these instruments as a screening tool only. We are not proposing that these would be used in an evidentiary way. They are simply gonna be used in the same way that the PBT is used to determine alcohol as the impairing substance. And then finally, just a couple of, of, of recent um, facts to illustrate the, the extent of the problem of drug impaired driving on Minnesota roads. I just reviewed a report yesterday from 24 DWI officers that the Office of Traffic Safety supports across the state. Fully 27% of the impaired driving arrests that those officers made in 2021 were for something other than alcohol. Uh, some other recent uh, statistics from uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They will uh, routinely do uh, roadside surveys of drivers. Um, and what they found is among weekend nighttime drivers, about 1.5% of the drivers that NHTSA had encountered are impaired over 0.08 with alcohol. What's alarming is that 22.5% had impairing substances on board. And to further that, in 2018, the Governor's Highway Safety Association uh, showed that 43.6% of drivers who are killed in a motor vehicle crash that are then tested for chemical impairment, 43.6% uh, of those uh, were drug positive. And beyond that, over half of those positive drivers were positive for two or more drugs, and there were also, and then 40.7% of them, in addition to the drug that was on board, also had alcohol on board. So we have a significant poly drug challenge as well. And so the, the pilot project that we're proposing uh, would allow us to study the problem as it exists on Minnesota roads, to build further that database so we can build the countermeasures to address these uh, serious public safety concerns and then to certify instruments that law enforcement would be able to use in the future. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak for or against this bill? Uh, we'll open it up for discussion to the left. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And good afternoon, Director Hansen. Good afternoon, nice sir. Nice to see you. Um, what's the technology that would be used in, in this device? Is, is it infrared spectrometry like with the PBT or is there some other technology involved? Director Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Latz, it's a great question. And I don't wanna over testify into something that I'm really not qualified in. I, I, I'm not familiar with the exact technology that's being used. What I can tell you is that we are planning uh, sometime later in March 
to bring industry and uh, national experts in the technology in for an actual physical demonstration of the technology. It will either gonna do that virtually or uh, hopefully in person if we can uh, swing the logistics so that the technology can actually be demonstrated. As far as exactly how they're analyzing these substances, I'm not sure what the technology is that they use. Sarah, I'd like to follow up. Uh, one reason I ask uh, is uh, uh, because I'm kind of looking down the road here. We've got a, ga a similar gap with regard to ignition interlock devices where you've got the ability to test for alcohol when someone's trying to start their car, but we don't have a comparable ability to test for controlled substances. Is the department looking down the road at the potential for using this kind of technology, or is it out there already among the uh, interlock manufacturers? Correct your answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Latz, another very good point. Um, and as we see this increase in controlled substance use, those are issues that we do need to confront. The technology for ignition interlock for drugs um, is under development in industry because they also recognize that this is an emerging concern. Um, it's not mature yet where they're ready to roll it out. But much like with ignition interlock, as, as it becomes more commonly used and it becomes more present in the system, that industry will step in and fill that void, I'm confident. Um, so, thank you. Uh, it sounds like there are a few other states that are, that are further along in the evaluation process than Minnesota. In Minnesota, we have not usually uh, simply accepted other states' pilot project results and substituted them for doing it here. Um, the, uh, part of it, because I think we just have greater confidence in our own agency's ability to, and our legislature's ability to fashion and design the pilot project that'll meet our needs. Um, but has the agency taken a look at whether or not, say, in Indiana um, or some of the other states that are further along in the process, whether they've had a robust enough um, or, or data rich enough uh, projects there that we could piggyback on their evaluations rather than waiting, creating and waiting for the results of our own? I think that, or I'm sorry. Correct your hands. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Lab. Um, I, I think that you make a valid point in that, you know, there has been rigorous testing of the technology conducted uh, already by a number of other states. Um, however, I think it's important for us, uh, for reasons you stated, that, that we validate our, use our own Minnesota validation process for these. Certainly, I think um, when we work with the BCA lab uh, in the toxicology section, that we will lean on the other states and see what they learned through their own certification processes. Uh, but I think most of us, um, uh, at least from our, our perspective, going into an evidentiary hearing, it would be uh, logistically much easier to have the, uh, the certification come from in-house, so to speak, or within Minnesota, rather than have to bring those outside experts. In. And then Mr. Chairman, just to, thank you, that's very helpful to know. In part, it's because of the, the need to be able to meet the evidentiary rules in Minnesota courts uh, that having the, the Minnesota-based pilot project will be helpful to lean on. Um, back to the ignition interlock, uh, one last thought. Uh, you know, maybe industry may be moving along. I would think they'd move as quickly as they can. I, I'm sure the basic technology is out there, especially if they're already available for, for uh, roadside testing for for fluids for controlled substances. Uh, so maybe the agency can encourage them or, or uh, try to expedite that process as well. Because not only is, is ignition interlock a whole lot safer for the public, because we know before interlock, and still there are a lot of people out there that don't have valid licenses because of alcohol or DUI revocations, but are out driving anyway, because they figure the likelihood of getting caught is low enough that they'll take the chance so they can still get to work or still get their kids to school um, and, and, and so on. Um, and the similar problem, uh, you know, with those who get revoked because of controlled substance related uh, DUIs, uh, but they don't, well, they don't necessarily have the admission interlock options, especially when you get to the, even the most serious kinds of events, which are criminal vehicular operational homicide cases. Right. People where you could argue there are even greater need to have ignition interlock to protect the public from those drivers than from a first time, uh, you know, high test DWI uh, you know, 
regular alcohol or the DWI. So, and, and the other, the flip side of that, of course, is we, we want people, the policy of the legislature has been, we want people to be on the road driving safely and not on the road driving without a valid license, without insurance. That was part of the whole theory behind the ignition and the lock as well. So the sooner we can get that technology available for controlled substances, I think the public will be safer. Individual drivers will have an easier time being able to uh, keep their jobs um, and take care of their families. And it, it's better all around. And we already have the infrastructure in place uh, because the alcohol ignition interlock system is already uh, pretty mature at this point in terms of providers and installation, and maintenance and monitoring and so on. I can encourage the agency to Director push Hanson. industry on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Director Hanson. Any Mr. Chair and, and Senator Glatz, yes, absolutely. I will uh, um, reach out to my, uh, my contacts within the industry and encourage that. And uh, when we bring them up uh, or bring them online for the demonstration, I will ask that they make that a part of their presentation to see just where the, that technology and its maturation is. Thank you. Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, is this working? Yep. I think it is. Thank you. Um, captain, I guess I'll call you Captain as last I remembered you uh, when you were Captain on the patrol. Uh, that's been uh, many years ago. Uh, I really appreciate this, and and, and uh, I went through the process of those PBTs years ago uh, as a young officer, uh, and the testing that went on previous to that. And uh, that science was, of course, recorded by the VCA at that time, and, and uh, from, from that point forward, it became evidentiary, and, and uh, it was a it was a good system. So, do you see something like this being the same? You're uh, you see in the future any quantitative uh, measurements? So, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody that's uh, uh, smoked a joint of marijuana uh, or two, and uh, is there any any kind of a um, uh, science yet that you're seeing, or law enforcement's privy to, to to be able to say that this is a uh, you know high high uh, um, absorbent of, of marijuana or less uh, marijuana we know stays in the system for, for up to a week. Um, so are you, are you seeing anything I'm looking at the other states uh, that are involved in any of these testing roadside testing that where they have anything quantitative yet? And I think that's probably the goal I'm guessing. Uh, Director Hans, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Ingerbertson, um, very good point. Um, the instruments, to a certain extent, will do that quantitative uh, look at a particular sample. Um, now that opens up a, a bit of a, a discussion on, you know, is is there a per se level for any type of a controlled substance for that we can uniformly apply to human beings? And when we look at drug impaired driving, it's very difficult to use that per se type of uh, measurement the same way we use alcohol, because alcohol affects most human beings the same way. When we're in that controlled substance arena, controlled substances do affect different individuals in many different ways uh, for a variety of reasons that um, people a lot smarter than me would have to, to testify before. So there, there is some quantitative uh, analysis that, that is currently con uh, uh, completed by the instruments that are being used in the field. And there, there's one state, I believe, and I can't think of the name, which one it is, that does use these roadside instruments as their evidentiary test, including the quantitative analysis. Um, so um, again, this is an emerging technology um, and it will get better the more that it's used and the more that it's developed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, uh... So are there any, anybody, I guess I didn't look at the packet that closely, are there any uh, folks in for or against this technology or this, or this bill uh, moving forward that you know of? I mean, are there, I would think the uh, uh, MAD would be certainly in, 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 uh, in favor of something like this. Is there anybody against this at all Director that Hansen. you know of, or maybe the Senator knows? I don't know. Uh, Director, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Ingerbertson, 
I'm not aware of any opposition to this. Um, when we introduced it last year, the Chiefs Association supported it, Sheriff's Association supported it, the DWI Task Force supported it. I've reached out to you know, that, those same entities again. I've heard back from the Sheriff's Association and they support the legislation. The DWI Task Force, as is evidenced by the letter of support uh, that they submitted, they do support this. Um, I'm not aware of, of any active uh, opposition to it, sir. Good. Just one comment and I'll finish up. Uh, Sorry. Thank you very much. And, and I'm, it's, it's time, you know, it's about time that we, we move forward to this. And, and we all know that there's a, a lot of substance abuse going on and it isn't just alcohol and, and it's other drugs. And, and we grappled with this idea of coming up with, how do we, how do we deal with that? You know, and uh, hopefully something will come of this because this is a huge public safety issue. And thank you, Senator, for bringing it forward. Sarah Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Senjimore, to your testifier, you mentioned in the testimony that uh, other states are using this technology, and I'm just wondering what states have been very successful as far as that this is kind of a model after, or are we just kind of in a the, the pilot project here that these other states are just doing pilot projects, or are they, have they actually been doing this for quite some time? Director Hansen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Anderson, um, there are some states who have been using the technology for uh, an extended period of time. And as I said, Michigan uh, is in the second stage of their pilot project. And uh, they're, uh, I believe this session actually trying to roll that in as a permanent one. I believe Arkansas has a very good model that's been referenced in the past. Um, and Indiana uh, also uh, has really gone in. Uh, they have some significant uh, significant challenges with controlled substance offenses there. Um, and my counterpart in Indiana has really, uh, they're, they're rolling out these instruments. They started in a small geographic area and quickly realized they needed to roll it out across the state. So there are some models that we could follow, uh, but we will tweak that to meet uh, both the legislation and then also the, the rules of evidence in Minnesota so that when we do bring these instruments on board or we return to this committee and ask for a permanent uh, uh, approval of it, that we have that data that is solid. Thank you. Any other questions before this committee? Um, members, we plan on dual tracking this particular DPS agency bill with the increase in drug-based DWIs on our roads. Uh, at least we suspect uh, we need to start this project, I think, as soon as we can. Uh, so that's why we're gonna vote on this particular singular bill today. And I'll be asking leadership to put this on a fast track um, so that we uh, uh, can get it to the floor as soon as we can. Um, but the longer the wait, I think the worse the situation gets. And we'd like to move this. Senator Latt. I'll move question? the bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Latt moves. Senate file 2854. Hearing no further discussion. Senator, Senator Latt moves 2854 as amended. As amended, be recommended to pass. Be recommended to pass. To move to the Senate. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Senju. We'll now move on to the rest of our agenda, starting with Senate File 2889. And uh, members, as instruction, um, the remaining bills will be laid over for further consideration. But we'll move on to Senate File 2889. And that is Senator Ingerbitz's bill. <clears throat> Senator Ingrid, it seems like it's a law enforcement uh, reunion back there. Right. <laughs> seems that way, um, which is always good. I've always enjoyed those uh, law enforcement uh, reunions. Yeah, but you're uh, ruining our efficiency in our Senate I, Judiciary Committee. I, of course, have had a lot, you know, was around a lot earlier than this young man sitting next to me here. So, uh, but nice it's always, it always a pleasure to work with him on different projects over the years. Yeah, well, I think you've preceded just about everybody. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's move on here, Mr. Chair. <laughs> 
Senator Ingebrigtsen, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, members, uh, Mr. Chair. Senate file 2889 is an appropriation uh, for crime prevention. And just real quickly, before I turn it over to uh, Chair Fletcher, the bill appropriates 2.4 million, 2 million in fiscal year 2022 for the, from the general fund of the Commissioner of Public Safety to grant a grant to Ramsey County Sheriff's Office to prevent and combat violent crime. The sheriff must coordinate its efforts with other sheriff's offices and police departments within the seven county metro area as well as metro transit. And we've had those discussions here as well, as you know, and may use these funds to reimburse directly compensate peace officers from other jurisdictions who assist in crime prevention efforts. Uh, the rest of the bill, I think, is pretty explanatory. It provides $600,000 in fiscal year 2022 from the general fund to the Commissioner of Public Safety for State Patrol's use of air patrol to assist in these efforts in, in coordination with the Ramsey County Sheriff. Uh, I know there's going to be some, some uh, issues and some questions about this, but uh, before that, Mr. Chair, if I can turn it over to Sheriff Fletcher. He can explain the bill a, a lot better than I, and uh, uh, we can move forward. But, Mr. Chair. Uh, one moment, uh, Senator uh, Ingebrigtsen, you also have a public safety report to the legislature by 2023, I believe. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I have a what? Sheriff Fletcher, welcome back to the committee. We sure see you a lot this year. That's probably not a good thing, Mr. Chair, but thanks for having me. Um, I do want to say that the ability to have flight assets from the Minnesota State Patrol is the best tool that law enforcement cur currently has to actually arrest offenders. I can't overstate it. I've been out on the street so many times that we have their assets in play and we're successful at apprehending serious offenders, carjackers, shooting drive-bys, et cetera. And of course, uh, Colonel Langer is here um, and can talk more about the asset. But um, we are in the situation now, as you know, that when we chase cars, we're liable for things that might result. And we would far prefer to have the ability to have a state trooper up above watching picking and choosing our spots as to when we can actually surround that car and bring it to a stop. And uh, we, I told uh, Matt, Colonel Langer, if we had that, if we had that asset up uh, 24 hours a day, we could significantly impact crime and drop it. And of course they can't do that. It's a very expensive asset. They have to train a lot of pilots, but expanding the available hours. And he and I spoke this morning, he's, always in favor of expanding those hours and bringing additional assets to our help. And uh, we're meeting here in the next, well, we've been meeting to talk about when we can target resources together. Um, but uh, I'll just wanna thank Senator Ingebrigtsen for his awareness of this issue and, and, and hope we can add this to our complement in law enforcement. Thank you. Uh, We'll open it up for discussion. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, sorry. I think what, what you were asking about earlier is this bill does, it does require the Commissioner of Public Safety to report to the mm -hmm. legislature by February 1st, 2023 on how the appropriations were being spent. So I think that's good to get on the record as well. So. Is there anyone else in the uh, room wishes to speak for or against this bill? Why don't you come up to the uh, testifying table, sir? Welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself for the record? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Rich Neumeister. When I take a look at the bill and I take a look on line 110, the words coordination, I think of one thing historically through, through the eyes of history. The Gang Strike Task Force, which was metro-wide in which in a bipartisan way and with an investigation, there were issues and lessons learned from that. So when I see $2.4 million going in that way, have we as a state and law enforcement entity to hit crime, have we learned the lessons? So my, my question is, and I think it's important that when this money is gonna be distributed in those efforts, 
that there be accountability and transparency and the agency, which would be the sheriff's office, that there be a very well documentation and record keeping of how that money is spent and how it is used to make sure in the efforts that they wanna do, because we don't wanna do the, some of the things that we have done before in the past. Now, if you take a look on the back of the page, it talks about a reporting system. One of the things in all my decades here at the legislature that I've observed at times, the legislature will say, we want a report. And then it's left up to the other parties to come back with the report. But I've seen many times over the years where you will say, this is what we want in the report to see if the money was used or not. So when you look at the $3 million being used here for the helicopter and for a somewhat of a coordinated uh, task force on crime, I think you have to have it beefed up a little bit. Some of the things like how many arrests, such things like that, as an example, you want to direct what you want to see how the money is used. Don't let the other parties decide because they may not give you what you want particularly in this area of law enforcement, dealing with people and rights and those kinds of things. So <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, for the record that those are my comments, I know this bill will probably be laid over and go into the omnibus crime bill or whatever it may be called uh, this year, but some of that accountability language or whatever I'm sure can be drafted for, for where you can direct what you want from the folks who are spending this money. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's a pleasure as always, particularly uh, someone who likes to get involved in the process that we're beginning to reopen again. Uh, Mr. Neumeister, I had a question um, on line 1.17. Uh, we give this authority and the appropriation to the commissioner of public safety. Uh, they'll be the backup organization that will be accountable for those funds. Uh, but I do uh, agree with you that this bill may need more specifics in the report. Uh, while you're here, can you tell us what specifics you may want to see in that report? Well, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, two things that I thought of my, for myself some of the things that we learned from a number of years ago. One is how many arrests? Uh, where's the money being appropriated to? Uh, was there any kind of forfeiture kind of issues or things like that? What involved drugs? What involved violence? And then the other thing is what was technology used? What, because as you know, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, technology moves real fast in the world of law enforcement. So that would be just a general kind of thing at the beginning. And Mr. Chairman, I'd be more than willing to give you some suggested area points to cover. Uh, Mr. Neumeister, um, there's just a few of us in the legislature that remembers the Metro uh, Street Gang Task Force and, and how the uh, administration of it was poorly run. Um, I don't think in that regard, there was any singular individual or agency uh, recognized as the one to run the, that particular strike task force, number one. Number two, um, it was later found out that there was some sloppy evidentiary standards that were not uh, established or at least not recognized in the evidence that they seized. Uh, the sale and forfeiture of certain evidence, cars in particular, uh, the records of those sales disappeared as did the money. And so it really was quite an embarrassment uh, for the metropolitan uh, participants in that when that was discovered. Uh, in this regard, at least we have the commissioner of public safety to oversee it. Uh, there's a uh, direction or a mission uh, directed at to prevent and combat violent crime in the seven county metro area uh, with a concentration of efforts in areas that have experienced the largest increase in violent crime. So we at least get a parameter of engagement. <clears throat> However, 
criminal activity goes far beyond just a, a map on the, uh, or a circle on a map. So in this regard, it is uh, beginning to give us a little bit more um, structure to the organization. But I agree with you. Uh, we're gonna lay this bill over and we're gonna give some thought to uh, what we expect in the, in the report. I think that's good advice. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. thank you very much, yeah. and members of the committee. Any other discussion? Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the other thing to note um, on your comments is that this is going to the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, which is a municipal government entity in um, an office in the municipal government, which is heavily audited and um, watched. So that uh, doesn't concern me all that much, but I will, I will say that I really like this idea. I think when you and I, Mr. Chair, were up at the uh, academy uh, with the troopers, we saw the benefit of how they can utilize air patrol in stop and clean, in apprehension and partnering and mm -hmm. collaboration. And I think it is extremely important tool. Um, and I think if anybody watches um, Sheriff Fletcher work on weekends, like my husband does religiously on live on patrol, um, you see the coordination and um, I think it, it demonstrates itself. So um, I do hope that this is included uh, in your final bill, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Bigham. Uh, any further discussion? I see it's Senator, or Senator. Uh, quit, quit Sheriff quit demoting him. return. <clears throat> what did you say, Senator Ingram? Quit demoting him, I said. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if he would interpret it that way. Uh, Senator, or Sheriff Fletcher. Uh, <laughs> Sheriff Limmer, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I could impose on our 30-year friendship. Before I leave today, I just... You're imposing. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, one minute or less. Uh, thank you, all of you, for everything you're doing to recognize the law enforcement needs throughout the state of Minnesota. I do wanna put one thing in your checklist. I've been at this for 44 years. I've never seen the stress and the wellness issues that are facing law enforcement as great as they are now. Mental health and wellness and traumatic stress. Anything you can do in this session to help us make sure we not only retain officers, but retain them in a healthy way, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you for the invitation. Hearing no further discussion, Senate file 2889 will be laid over. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. And we will now move to uh, Senate file 2953 and Senate file 3029. Uh, we're, uh, for members and, and the public, we'll be having both Senator Matthews and Latz present their respective bills back to back they're slightly different. They kind of go in the same direction. Um, that way we can make comment on their similarities and differences between the two versions. And then uh, we'll move into testimony after their presentation. And testifiers can then comment on one or both bills. Uh, we'll st start with Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. I have Senate file uh, 2953 uh, to remove uh, online uh, court filing fee for um, accessing documents. Just for some background and history, the judicial branch has long had their own access policy for when and how the public can see court data, such as filings and motions, and the legislature has given authority to the courts to charge costs for copies of these documents. Uh, for many years, uh, Minnesota statutes have allowed the courts to charge $8 for uncertified copies of court records. Regardless of size, whether one page or a thousand, the cost was the same $8. In the past, this was a question of a person physically going to a courthouse and asking for a copy of these records. However, in the past few years, the judicial branch has started a pilot project to get more documents on the judicial branch website so that the public can access them more easily without a physical visit. And this became especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic when there was limited or, or none uh, access to the physical court properties. 
So the uh, during the beginning of this uh, project, the judicial branch waived their $8 fee for uncertified copies, uh, but they're approaching the end of the pilot project and uh, the system will be permanent and fully functional by the end of 2022. The last piece of the pilot project is to rewrite a code to create a shopping cart to begin charging that $8 per copy fee again. And that's what a lot of us have heard about uh, from constituents and from others. I first heard about this through uh, an independent journalist that has utilized this very heavily and was concerned about the transparency uh, piece that would hinder accessing uh, records. So the uh, judicial branch can charge what the legislature authorizes, and this would be a move to, uh, to change that, uh, to not allow for a fee charged to these records. Uh, it will waive that. Uh, and it, there will still be questions about whether it is appropriate to waive this fee for online records only or for uh, all records uh, requested, uh, which is, I believe, what Senator Latz's bill does. So I grabbed uh, the first bill uh, that I found uh, dealing with this issue, the online court records one. Uh, I also like Senator Latz's version as well and uh, would appreciate uh, the committee's consideration of this issue as we uh, clear up and make sure that there's open transparency to uh, these judicial records. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Chair Matthews also thank you uh, for the opportunity to present today on this bill and, and to uh, share the presentation desk uh, with our civil law chair who um, is carrying a, a, a very similar bill. Um, we have a lot of consensus on this and uh, it, it's motivated, I think, by a number of concerns. One is the public's accessibility to uh, judicial documents, which are otherwise already public. Um, it's just there are significant barriers right now to the public being able to access and see those documents. Uh, prior to the uh, advent of the online system um, through the courts, uh, members of the public would literally have to drive to um, or otherwise get themselves to a courthouse uh, wait at the counter, talk to a staff person at the counter, ask for the documents, and be prepared to pay at the counter as well. Uh, and to give you an example of the, of the payment barrier, uh, the state courts um, are required by statute, they don't have a choice on this, they're required by statute to charge $8 for an uncertified copy of the document at the counter. In contrast, the federal courts charge 25 cents a page. Uh, so um, it's, uh, there's a different way to do it for typical short documents. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot cheaper to do it in the federal court than it is um, in the state court. So there's the public access to it, but there's also a, the ac aspect of access to the, from the media or the press. Uh, they rely a lot and we rely a lot on their reporting of what's happening in the courts. And you can't really get a full picture of what's happening in the courts if you don't see the underlying documents that are related to a case, whether it's the civil or criminal complaint, which lays out the claims of a plaintiff, or in the case of the criminal case of the state, uh, the, the crimes that they're alleging a person, uh, an accused, uh, committed, um, whether it's supporting documents, whether motions to dismiss, or memoranda of law uh, that are filed and, and may be public in, in most cases. Um, as well as just scheduling documents, uh, which now include a lot of notices of remote hearings uh, by Zoom, which are still public court appearances. Uh, it's just that uh, members of the public or the press don't have to physically go to the courthouse and sit in the courtroom. Um, they can log in online. And the third aspect is, of this is from the practitioner's standpoint. Uh, and I've got, obviously I've got a personal experience on this one, uh, when uh, the uh, pandemic shut down the courts and when the courts reopened, um, it changed the way a lot of lawyers practice law, especially those of us who are frequently in court. And my law practice, because I do a fair amount of criminal defense, it was quite often physically in the courthouses. As a part of my practice, I'm a volunteer on a panel that advises 
people who come to court without their own lawyers on uh, how to approach the case, give them some ideas on what, the, what they're facing, on how they might talk to the prosecutor about it, help them understand the, the, the pros and the cons and so on. And if I were there at the courthouse, um, I could get a copy of something from the clerk to help me understand exactly what they're charged with. Uh, when we started doing this online, it was not so easy uh, because I could look up the, the, uh, the basic sheet that lists the proceedings, but I couldn't look at any of the underlying documents. When the pilot project became more advanced and documents like the criminal complaints became available, um, I could advise people with a lot more information about what their case was. So now I sit at my desk in my law office um, and I go into a breakout room with people who wish to speak with the volunteer panel attorney, but I'm doing it. And there are about 30 of us in Hennepin County, for example, that are part of this volunteer program. It also exists in other counties. Um, and I can tell them, give me a second. I got the, uh, the court file number from the clerk. I'm gonna pull up your documents and I can tell you exactly what you're facing. And a lot of defendants don't understand exactly what they're looking at. They may not be able to cite the specific nature of, of the offense that they're charged with. They might not know they've got three counts instead of two counts that they're facing. Um, I can look all of that up online. I can also get copies of, of other documents that are available to the court, including telling them, you know, what they're here for. Is there a warrant out for their arrest? You know, exactly what the story is. So I can do my job better and more easily say defendants out. Uh, there are a lot of other defense lawyers that would be able to access information uh, more easily as well. And this would extend also to civil cases. So I can do the same with other civil cases that I work on because my practice is a mixed practice. And uh, so um, I got feedback from a lot of other defense lawyers in the field about how valuable this tool was for them. And uh, I started reaching out to the Bar Association, for example, and, and they have a letter um, in our packet that the Bar Association supports um, the free access to these documents. Uh, so for all, the, for, for public access, for the media access, a very important constitutional uh, role that the media plays to inform the public about what's happening in our, in our criminal, or our, in our justice system, criminal and civil justice system, and for practitioners. Um, as well as, uh, I suppose, the individuals who have cases in court that want to learn more about or get their own documents. Um, there's an advantage here for everyone. And $8 a document is just a big barrier, um, especially if you're downloading three, four documents per case. All of a sudden, you're looking at, uh, just to find out what the basic charges are uh, and, and some other, and, and remote hearing notices and stuff like that, you're already talking $16, $24. Um, every time you need to do that. Uh, so this would work out better for, for all of our, our, our civil society, I think, um, if we have more equitable, indeed, free access uh, to the courts. Um, the bill that I have before you um, simply eliminates the charge for all document access online and at the counter. Um, and I think we'll have some testimony as to the advantage of eliminating it at the counter as well. Um, not everyone has easy access online to getting online. And uh, you know maybe they have access to their cell phones. A lot of people don't have laptops or desktops at home. They may not have printers um, at home. Um, and uh, so they go into the, they may have to go to the courthouse. Uh, and I think, again, if we can lower the barrier, um, eliminate the barrier other than travel for those who don't have the online access. Uh, to be able to get that stuff. It's, it's a whole lot easier for everyone. Um, and uh, these are public systems. The documents are public, it seems to me. They ought to be accessible to the public with the lowest barrier possible. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, we're gonna open it up for uh, discussion now. Uh, I had one question to both of you, if I could. Um, is it true that the monies that would be involved it it comes or it goes into the general fund it doesn't go into a judiciary branch fund at all that's correct all right thank you okay um, jeff shorba is remote shorba 
There you are. I am here, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm, I would have been there in person. Sorry, I got a little late notice about this, but I am happy to participate. And um, I Why just. Why don't you introduce yourself and then you can go on with your uh, sure. testimony? Sure. My name is Jeff Shorba. I'm the state court administrator for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. And I was asked to join you today to give a brief update on what we consider one of the biggest pandemic era accomplishments of our court system, which is the launch of online access to district court case documents. As you've heard from Senator Matthews and Senator Latz, uh, we launched Minnesota court records online this year on March 17th. It was launched in three phases. The first phase allows user, allowed users um, to access most public district court case documents, but only when searching with a case number. So they had to know the case number in order to find the document. But what we saw very quickly uh, was there was a pent up demand for this kind of service. The first day we launched it, we had more than 3,700 users download more than 10,000 case documents using the application. We spent the rest of 2021 developing the second phase, which we launched on December 7th, and that added several enhancements, including more robust search functionality, um, allowed people to find documents a little bit more easier. And what we found is at this point, there's been about 3 million documents downloaded from MCRO, which is Minnesota Court Records Online. Then we moved into phase three, which will provide a little bit more search functionality. It's our final phase. And we'll also get to the issue of fees. Um, so what the fee process that we were using is to try to mimic what was in the statute. And the statute, as you've heard already, required $8 to uh, get a document. So we decided we would follow the statute. We didn't want to eliminate money from the general fund. Um, so we're developing a fee structure that would allow you to look at the first page of a document for free, as Senator Latz was saying, to sort of find out what the document is all about. And I will let you know that about two thirds of all court documents are only one page long. Uh, but if you want the whole document, then you'd have to pay the $8 as set by statute. Um, and I understand the Senator Matthews and Senator Latz's proposal and to tell you the truth, um, all we would like to do is to figure out an easiest way to, to deal with this situation. This is really a legislative decision. If you don't want to charge for documents and tell us not to charge for documents, we're not going to charge for documents. Um, if you tell us not to charge for online, we won't charge for online. Although my preference, I think our preference is to have something consistent. So as Senator Latz said, those who can't get online aren't charged something at the courthouse versus somebody you can get online and would get it for free. So the easiest for us would be to say, we're not charging for documents and that would increase the transparency. These are, as they said, public documents. Um, so I'm looking just for guidance from the legislature. We are just trying to follow what you had in statute. There is a provision in the statute where the $8 is charged that says if any other services are required by law for which no fee is provided, such fee as compares favorably with those who are in should be provided. So we thought this was a comparable service to getting it at the counter. Um, and that's why we were going to move into phase three by the end of the year to charge for these documents. But we are perfectly acceptable to not charging. What I will caution you, uh, there have been some bills discussed where maybe they charge $5 for online and $8 at the counter or $2 online or a page thing. That's going to stymie our development. We spent a lot of time developing a system that has really received, I think, rave reviews from the public and the media and attorneys. Uh, so I just would ask to have some consistent approach so that we don't have to go back and try to spend more money on development for this. So that's my general overview, Chair, and um, I'm open to questions if people have any. Thank you, Mr. Shorba. Uh, we're gonna go through our testifiers and then we'll open it up for questions. The next individual is uh, Mr. John Cavanaugh from NPR. Senior counsel, that is. Mr. Cavanaugh. Welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself for the record and then proceed? 
Good afternoon, Chair Limmer, uh, members. I am John Cavanaugh. I'm Senior Counsel with uh, Minnesota Public Radio. Uh, today I'm appearing in front of you uh, representing the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, the Minnesota Newspaper Association, and NPR as well. Our organizations have submitted a joint letter, uh, and it should be in your packet, uh, uh, but uh, the letter is uh, supporting the elimination of the uh, $8 uh, fee to view or download uh, court documents on the new macro system. Um, Minnesotans should, should not have to ration their research of court documents based upon their ability to afford access to public information. Our readers, our viewers, our listeners, and you <laughs> ultimately expect us to be thorough and accurate in our reporting. Attaching fees with no relation to the actual costs that provide these services and which simply go to the general fund only serve as an impediment to our work. Already financially struggling local and regional news outlets would be hardest hit by the proposed fee. These organizations report stories important to their community <laughs> and are critical to the American democracy. Minnesotans are best served by local and regional media with full access to public information. We appreciate the court's upgrade of the macro system and thank Senator Matthews and Senator Latz for bringing forth these two bills. Uh, just to uh, uh, respect the uh, chair's uh, uh, our request, uh, we do actually prefer that uh, the online and the uh, over-the-counter or the in-person documents are treated in the same way and eliminate all those fees. All right, thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to, uh, Got to get myself organized here. Uh, Mr. Eric Liefering from Star Tribune. Mr. Liefering, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, my name is Eric Liefering. I'm an editor at the Star Tribune, where I oversee projects and investigations. Um, as you've heard from others, access to criminal and civil court cases is a core function of what we journalists do every day, multiple times a day, often. Uh, imposing fees for viewing or downloading court documents would have an immediate chilling effect on the ability of reporters and the public at large to follow the workings of Minnesota's judicial system. And the proposed charges would be especially burdensome on smaller news outlets in greater Minnesota that are already facing significant financial challenges. The proposed charges also would have a dramatic impact on the watchdog function that citizens of Minnesota expect from journalists. Last year, the Star Tribune published an investigative project exposing abuses by companies that buy financial settlements from accident victims. The reporter spent two years on that project. He examined 1,700 court cases from across Minnesota. Each of those cases typically had five or 10 additional documents. He also looked at all the other civil and criminal proceedings involving the folks who sold their settlement payments. In total, he examined more than 20,000 court documents. We invested two years in reporting and writing that project. Would we have been able to do so if these proposed charges were in place? It's a question I hope I never have to answer. Um, uh, Court records are public records, as others have said, and they should be available to all, not just the people who can afford, people or institutions that can afford to pay for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Mr. Joel Carlson. Welcome back to the committee. Mr. Thank Carlson. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. It is indeed a pleasure to be back in front of you once again in room 15. Uh, I'm Joel Carlson. I own a legal research and government affairs business here in, in St. Paul, and I represent the Minnesota Association for Justice. Um, I mostly am here so that Senator Matthews knows that I support several of his bills. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, we do, uh, 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 we recognize that in addition to the good comments that have been made by the courts and others, uh, all of these court costs and fees that you look at are access to justice issues. 
And whether it is your filing fee that you cannot uh, pay or the cost it is to get medical records or the cost to get your documents from the courthouse, they are all access to justice issues. And we applaud uh, these two uh, legislators for bringing these two bill forward and uh, we fully support them. Thank you, Mr. Chair, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And we'll end with Mr. Ryan Elsie. I, I'm online, Your Honor. You're or, online. I see yes, you Thank you. Uh, yes. Why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. My name is Ryan Else, E L S E. I am here on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers uh, in favor of Senate File 3029. I echo everything that has been said by the courts and Senator Latz about the professional access to the documents, how important it is in doing our job that we have access to those documents, especially in advising indigent clients and being able to provide our services at a low a cost as possible. Um, but I think the one thing that needs to be understood even more is that the equal access to justice issue. Um, a lot of our clients really are indigent beyond what most of us understand. And $8 is a lot of money. That's a meal to them. Um, and that acts, and they are often the ones that cannot access the documents online. And so they're at the counter and it's a good reason why the record should be treated the same either way. Um, that goes across the board for eliminating fines and fees. Uh, you've seen me up here many times talking about that. Um, you know, it, we don't have an equal justice system if a rich person can, you know, access and pay fines and fees a lot easier than a poor person. So, uh, I'll cut my remarks short so save your time, but I will be here for questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elson. Sorry to uh, mispronounce your name, uh, but uh, we're going to move on to discussion. Any questions, comments by our members? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess I'll proceed from here at the, at the committee table since that's where I, I took my seat. Um, I just want to note for uh, public and for committee members that in our packets, we have additional letters of support. Uh, from Lynn Koji, the Minnesota Council um, on uh, uh, Government Information, um, from the uh, Minnesota State Bar Association, uh, which is the organized uh, group of all the lawyers um, in the state or representing certainly as, as an organization, um, and from Mid Minnesota Legal Aid, uh, and Ron Elwood on their behalf um, in support of uh, uh, these uh, bills as well. Good notation, Senator Latz. Um, appreciate that. Uh, it didn't seem like there's a lot of discussion, uh, but I had a couple of questions either to either author. Um, oftentimes when we open up uh, public records, which is an admirable thing to do, we don't anticipate the full cost. And I'm just wondering, I looked at the uh, fiscal notes, but I'm, I have to ask someone how they came up with these numbers. And um, does anyone have any direct analysis? Perhaps our fiscal analyst can help me out. The, the numbers are quite a bit different. Uh, $233,000 in fiscal year 23 compared to 362,000 in the same year. And the bottom line in 2025, almost double uh, one cost versus the other. So, uh, Ms. Kerr, could you maybe just briefly explain how the numbers are so different? We, sure, really, didn't, we really didn't talk about in the two separate bills how they uh, are different on the funds. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, the way I read the fiscal note is the total amount collected by the courts for document fees was uh, 694000 in 2019. 
and then it went down to 586 and 20, 460 and 21, and 330 and 22. So it's been going down. Sorry. Um, they came up for came up with a number of uh, 262. They meaning uh, the Supreme Court administrator in 23 and and 395 and 24. That is reflect that number is reflected. That's a total collection that's reflected in Senator Latz's bill because he eliminates the fee. And uh, Senator Andrews' bill is 59% of Senator Latz's um, 395 or $233,000. And they just came up with that. Uh, that re reflects um, free downloaded documents, but where if you show up at state court administrator's office or district court administrator's office, you would pay the $8 in person. All right. Um, I would imagine that's probably reflective of the time of labor costs. If it was requested at the court, people running to and fro, getting files, holding well, them up on record. Mr. Chairman, members, that simply re reflects what the legislature said we're going to charge for fees. Right? Right. That's, um, and, and like it's been stated, uh, this has nothing to do with court financing. This is, flows directly into the general fund. So it's just a, a revenue reduction to the general fund. Mm -hmm. And the courts, uh, like Mr. Sharva said, are really indifferent to the fee because it doesn't affect them. They're just the collector. In fact, it's probably easier if they don't have to collect. Yeah. It's, when you compare these figures, either one to a $50 billion budget, it's the proverbial spit in the ocean. Uh, Sarah Latz. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think maybe I would add um, the marginal cost of not collecting a fee that's not yet charged yet for an online download of a document mm -hmm. should be about zero. I mean, the cost of the electricity yeah. running through the, uh, the online system yeah. to download the document, even if it's printed out at the end users, you know, it, it's my printer, my ink, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, or my laser uh, cartridge, mm -hmm. you know, where the cost is. Um, so, I mean, I suspect part of the fiscal note, which I have not read carefully, is sort of the, the, the lost future revenue if there was not the charge at the counter, which now exists, but which will go away. Um, I suspect, you know, maybe that's part of it, been declining um, already anyway. Um, but uh, heck, it would probably save the environment, you know, because you wouldn't have people driving to the courthouse and incurring the costs relating to that, let alone their own time. Mm -hmm. um, and you would eliminate the, the labor that's involved in getting the documents and presenting them. Um, I would note this does not affect any charges for certified copies. So if someone wants a certified copy of a document that they would need to submit for some legal purpose, they would still need to go to the counter, ask for the certified copy and pay the $14, which is in statute already. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a real quick question for you, the authors. Uh, um, for police reports, do you pay for police reports when you go to the counter? Uh, uh, or is that, a, is that a local decision? I, I've been away from it so long, I know we used to charge a dollar a fee for an accident report, things like that. Is that still going on? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in most cases, the police reports are not filed with the court as a court document. Um, we would get police reports directly from the prosecutor or often referred over to the police department, the law enforcement agency, and then we do pay the cost that the prosecutor charges us or the agency charges us uh, for those records. Um, there are some cases I've seen online, sometimes police reports are filed with a court document and then I can pull them up, um, if you will. But uh, in, in most cases, it's not the situation. We're, we're paying for this, you know, as a, as a lawyer on behalf of a client or the defendants, if they're pro se, uh, they pay for them also to get copies of their own police reports in the case. Okay. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair, it was, thinking, it was mentioned there was, gonna, there was gonna be some energy savings here. I think this should be coming to my committee if we're talking about <laughs> saving the environment. <laughs> this will be my green bill of the year. <laughs>
I don't think I'm hearing any further discussion <laughs> except from Nothing Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, so this bill will be laid over as well. Um, there might be a little more discussion. Yeah, both bills will be laid over at this time. Uh, there's no further business before this committee. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.